You know, when you read a book and you can't put it down and you want to have a conversation with the author, well, that's what's happening in this episode. I've had these books on my wish list for years now and finally read all three in less than a month. They're page turners and what I love filled with history. The Magdalene Line is by far one of my favorite trilogies, and I am so excited to introduce you to the author, Kathleen McGowan, in this episode. I was in the Vatican. I was in St. Peter's, and um, I was looking at Michelangelo's masterpiece, the sculpture of the Pieta, and uh, I turned around, and I saw just a little bit ahead of me this huge statue of this woman. It's like more than life-size marble statue of this very profoundly powerful woman. And, and I, I got closer to her, and she's holding in one arm the crown of the Pope. She's got the papal tiara like this. And then in her other hand, she's holding a baton of power and the keys to the church. She's holding St. Peter's keys in her hand. And I was like, what is, <laughs> what is even happening right now? Who is this woman <laughs> in the middle of the Vatican holding all the power? And why are we <laughs> why are we talking about whoever she is? Welcome to the Brave Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Tanya Lynn, founder of Sistership Circle and author of Open Your Heart and The Art of Leading Circle. I'm the mother of two girls and eight on the Enneagram, aka the Challenger. Happily married to my business partner, Brent, love connecting with nature, and have put in well over 10,000 hours circling with other women. On this podcast, we will explore how to embody the brave woman so that you can take action on your dreams and desires, unapologetically speak your truth, and live life on your own terms. Grab a seat and a cup of tea, and let's get started. Oh my goodness. I have the incredible author, Kathleen McGowan, on with me today, and this is just getting me so giddy because I have been obsessed, obsessed with her books, and today her latest book is coming out, and so we're going to cover all of this. I'm I'm just so thrilled because this has been such a courageous journey for her to write these books and especially the new one, which we're going to get into. And I am wanting every single woman to read not only the Magdalene Line trilogy, but also this upcoming book. So welcome, Kathleen. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your amazing work Uh. with our community. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So I would love to start with what the, well, let's just give our readers, or not our our readers, but soon to be readers, our listeners here, a little bit (laughs) of background on the Magdalene Line trilogy and just a little synopsis of, of what it is, the books, as well as what had you write this really important masterpiece, these, these trilogies really truly a masterpiece. Uh, just that background to start with. Well, thank you, first of all, for your very kind words. Um, you know, at the very beginning of this journey, I did not set out to write fiction. Fiction was not my original intention. Um, at the very beginning of this journey, which started back in 1989 when I was pregnant with my oldest son, um, and I, I had come from a journalism background, and it had been my experience in the field in journalism that um, things that we were reading in the papers weren't really what happened, right? So uh, I was working overseas as a journalist, and I would be uh, on site when an event occurred, and then I would read about it the next day in the papers, and I would go, oh, it didn't happen that way because I was there. Um, and I had this revelation that... Uh, history was not what happened. History was what was being written down. Uh, and that they were two very different things. And this was, this was really, really earth shattering for me. Right. And, you know, I was, I was in my, my mid twenties at the time and, and I just, it just kind of rocked my world. It was like, wait a minute, if everything, even today, you know, even today in the eighties and the early nineties, 
what we're looking at on paper isn't accurate, then what does that mean if we go even farther back? The farther back we go, the, the less reliable history is going to be, right? Because history is always written by who? The people who win. History is written by the winners. And uh, the women were never the winners. <laughs> and that was what began to really strike me, was like these, that there were all these stories about women in history that I felt where the women were being uh, maligned or misunderstood or in some way scapegoated, right? So what I started to do was put together this list of women in history that we think of as bad girls, um, that we think of as some way scandalous, right? So that was, and that was uh, Marie Antoinette and Lucretia Borgia, Mary Queen of Scots, uh, Anne Boleyn. And um, I had a list of about 15 women who, um, you know, I really felt had been misunderstood. And uh, then I had, I had a wonderful teacher in the 90s, early 90s, 1990, from 91 to 93. And she said to me when I started working on this project, she said, you're missing somebody from this list. You need to add Mary Magdalene to the list. And uh, at first I was like, oh, I, no, no, I'm not adding Mary Magdalene to the list because I didn't want religious figures on the, on the list. I felt it's too polarizing. You know, I didn't want to get into it. I knew that religion was going to be dangerous. I was, I was really comfortable talking about history, but I wasn't sure how comfortable I was talking about religion. And she's like, no, hear me out. <laughs> you know, your thesis is that women have been intentionally lied about in history and that you are here to tell the truth, to find new versions of these stories that uh, redeem these women, even ev avenge these women. I've used the word avenging a lot in the, in the course of the last 25 years. I feel like an avenger um, of these women, history avenger, I suppose. Um, but what she said that changed my whole life was what we know about Mary Magdalene is um, that we can prove your thesis through this one character. Because even the church has admitted that they deliberately lied about her to change the story to suit their narrative. They admitted it. They came out in 1969 and said, this never should have happened. She never should have been called a, a fallen woman or a redeemed pro or a, an unre you know, a repentant prostitute or you know, a woman who was redeemed for her sins. Um, none of those things should have occurred because they aren't really true. And so that was when I went, wait a minute, this is, she's right. It's like, we have this example of this woman who was so profoundly important and so powerful that the Pope in, at the end of the sixth century says, hey, we're going to use her as an example. Um, and then he creates this entire story, this narrative around who she is that turns her into this fallen woman, this repentant prostitute, this sinner, which has absolutely nothing to do with who she, who she really was. So that was my starting point. I was like, wait, I'm going to go after this Mary Magdalene story as my proof that this has been happening in history. So what I didn't expect was that once I started following Mary Magdalene, she would not leave me alone. So that was the, that was, that was the beginning. So that's how Magdalene sort of took over my life. And, and that was the, the sort of starting point for, um, for my writing. And so I set off to write these stories about these women um, and start to do this research. But what happened was in 1995, I went to the south of France to start doing research on Mary Magdalene. And then I just fell down the rabbit hole. You know, I was like Alice in Wonderland. All of a sudden I discovered that there was a whole new world out there uh, of information and, and ent entire cultures of people who had been devoted to these stories for 2,000 years and nobody was telling them. And, um, and that's how sort of Magdalene became my muse. And I realized that um, I really wanted to tell this story about who she was. This, you know, we look at her in general, sort of globally, as this, this person who was important uh, in the life of Jesus, however you choose to look at her, right? But in France, they look at her very differently because she arrives there after the crucifixion and she establishes the first, the first homeless shelter, the first, you know, the first mission. Um, you know, she becomes this incredible force. And essentially, Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene evangelizes France almost single-handedly by herself. Uh, in the first century. And what, so what's happening is France is evolving into this beautiful culture of like what original Christianity was before the dogma, before the, the power 
the things that happen in Rome. And you have A, a version that is led predominantly by women, Mary Magdalene and her sister Martha, um, and the women who surround them. There are other Marys involved. And so you have this beautiful version um, of a new spirituality that comes to France that's about love uh, and honor and the divine feminine spirit and faith and charity and community. And it's it's really governed by what we think of now as really feminine principles, collaboration, cooperation, compassion, uh, all of these things. So this beautiful culture is flourishing in France. So at the same time, in Rome, the boys are creating uh, their version. And unfortunately, what happens is Christianity becomes Romanized, mm -hmm. right? So the Roman culture is violent, it's hierarchical, it's patriarchal, um, it's misogynist. And that is what evolves in, in the Roman church. Uh, and the, one of the most important elements from the very early days of the church is to remove women from power. Right. So now we have two very different versions of what Christianity was and what it becomes. And I was fascinated by that. And as I dove deeper into it, I discovered that for the last 2000 years, there have been incredible stories of women who have totally changed the world, who have risked everything and often lost everything um, for these principles of faith and love and charity. And those were the stories that I was going to tell. And that's what my series is about. Oh, my God. And they're so good. And so in book two, you talk about Matilda, who is just not even mentioned in history, really, right? So, so I'd love to even hear your process of um, how you are doing the research when there's this woman, for example, Matilda, who basically doesn't even exist in the books, right? And so what was that process of really discovering these women and then bringing them to life in your book? Well, as you know, in my books, my books take place in the present time and then they take place in the past. So I go back and forth between now and then. And my modern character, my protagonist is a journalist named Maureen. And Maureen is the one who discovers these women and goes in search of them. And it's not a secret that Maureen is... is more than loosely based on myself. Yeah. And uh, whereas I am not Maureen, I will say a lot of my experiences are Maureen. And when you read the Book of Love, um, the way that I discovered Matilda is almost exactly the way I write it for Maureen. So in my case, um, I was in the Vatican. I was in St. Peter's. And um, I was looking at Michelangelo's masterpiece, the sculpture of the Pieta. And uh, I turned around and... I saw just a little bit ahead of me, this huge statue of this woman. It's like more than life-size marble statue of this very profoundly powerful woman. And, and I, I got closer to her and she's holding in one arm the crown of the Pope. She's got the papal tiara like this. And then in her other hand, she's holding a baton of power and the keys to the church. She's holding St. Peter's keys in her hand. And I was like, what is, what is even happening right now? Who is this woman <laughs> in the middle of the Vatican holding all the power? And why aren't we, why aren't we talking about whoever she is, right? And there was a, there's a plaque, and uh, I discovered the sculpture was created by Bernini. So created by Bernini, and that means that um, it was commissioned by the Pope uh, during, the, during that period, which was the 17th century. So now I know a pope commissioned this statue uh, from the most important and famous sculpture, sculptor and, uh, in, in the world at the time. So now I know this woman is really important. So now I'm really determined to figure out who she is. And there's a, there's a Latin inscription, which I could kind of roughly translate about um, how she had a noble spirit and, and her valor was important. But it also said that she was buried there. And that was another issue for me. I'm like, wait. So this woman is also buried in St. Peter. She's buried a few hundred feet away from the original St. Peter. What is happening now? And nobody could tell me. I asked people at the Vatican for three days, um, and they would gave me kind of generic, oh, she lived in the Middle Ages, and when she died, she left her fortune to the church, and that's why she's here. And I went, uh-uh. 
<laughs> there's something at work here that really, really needs to be investigated. And, uh, and, and that's how Matilda of Canosa took over my life. Um, and because she, you know, initially when I first wrote the outline for the book of love for my publisher, she was a really minor character. I was like, I'm going to insert her cause she's interesting. Um, so she was a super minor character. I wasn't even sure how much I was going to write about her, but then I started doing the research. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this woman is phenomenal, right? You've got this woman who she's she's just she's Matilda of Canosa is the most incredible character I've ever discovered. Bar none. You could not invent a character this amazing. Right. I mean, there is a thankfully um, during her lifetime, she died in uh, 1115. Right. She was born in 1045. Um, during her lifetime, there was a monk who was very devoted to her, and he ultimately wrote uh, her life story, and that still exists. So that's where we get the majority of information about her, something called the Vita Matildas, the life of Matilda. But I started reading things like when she was 13 years old and she was the only child left, her brother had died, she was the only child left um, of the Duke of Tuscany, right? Her parents had huge amounts of land and wealth, and her father told her, you can't inherit because you're a girl. And she said, show me where it says that. Um, and she was, she was incredibly hit. Her father had educated her, and that was unusual in the Middle Ages for a girl to be educated. Um, and what she did is she read the actual law that said, um, it did not say a girl could not inherit. It said you could only inherit if you could lead an army. And so she went to her father and said, I want to learn how to lead an army. Uh, and and he gave her lessons in war. And by the time she was 16, um, she was going into battles. And by the time she was 18, she was leading She was leading an army. She inherited all of the wealth of her parents, became the most powerful woman in Europe, and controlled over a third of what we now know of the Italian landmass. Amazing character. Yeah. And she used that power. I want to say yeah. it's important. She used that power in the force of good right? The forces of good and right. So it was not just that she wanted power. It was not just that she wanted to control these territories. She wanted to change the world. Matilda of Canosa was the first person in the Middle Ages to say equality is a thing. She was the first person to say not only should women be treated as the equals of men, but the poor should be treated as the equals of the rich. And this was in the middle of feudalism, and it was scandalous. But it was something that she was willing to fight for, and, and fight for it she did. And she was also the very first woman, first person that we are aware of to create shelters for victims of domestic violence. She would actually go into the homes of women who were abused by their husbands, pull them out, and take them to safety. Amazing character. Wow. And so where was... The so what was the research that you were doing? Were you going in and having conversations? Um, I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, the difference between actually being there and listening to the stories versus mm -hmm. what the historians have read who are at the universities, right? So tell us a little bit about the discovery right. process of this woman's story. So my process has always been to go outside of the written accounts. You start, I start at the written accounts, you have to, right? You start with what the academics are looking at, but you have, you have to realize that it's, the, it's really the starting point. Uh, it's not the ending point. There's so much more. So the way I look at history, I think history is a, is a mosaic, right? It's a mosaic and there are all these beautiful sort of shiny glittering pieces. Um, and it's my job to go and find those pieces and then put them together and then create a real picture out of them, right? So the basis is always, so my basis, for example, was the Vita Matildas, right? So this, this document that was written in Latin in the, uh, in the 12th century about her life, that was a starting point. But then from there, I spent, you have to get, you have to dig into the cultures where these people live, and that's what I do. Um, so the majority of my research is on site. So I spent a lot of time in Italy and I went to the places where Matilda was raised. And those are the places where you're going to get stories and information that you're not going to find in libraries on the Internet. People always say to me, oh, where can I read that history? It's like you can't. You have to go and find it. You know, you have to go to the places where the history is held. And, and there are an, an enormous number of places in Italy that revere her to this day. 
um, where you can go and, and learn a lot of information about Matilda. But you have you have to go after it. It's you know it's and 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 you have to be able to you have to be patient sometimes. You have to get you know translations, whatever Italian or Latin, whatever the versions, you know medieval versions, that kind of thing. I did a lot of research in Florence because um, she was also the Countess of Tuscany, and uh, the later. Um, Later leaders in Tuscany maintained a, a library that had information about Matilda as well. So I did a lot of, you know, a lot of cultural information. Uh, you learn a lot through art. You learn a lot through architecture. Or I always say in my books that art will save the world because art contains all this information um, that it, we don't see necessarily in writing. A picture is worth a thousand words or ten thousand words, and sometimes a hundred thousand words, because you know a lot of the things that were happening during these periods. All of these women that I write about are spiritually important. They were spiritual leaders. And at the time, being a woman and a spiritual leader was usually going to get you in the middle of a town square uh, burning at the sink, right? So it was a very dangerous thing to be a powerful woman during, uh, or who was attempting to be a spiritual leader of any kind. So what happened was they learned how to hide their, their teachings in plain sight. And art is one of the ways in which this happens. This is why books like the Da Vinci Code, you know, were, you know, were, were important um, because they talked about how uh, how images were used to hide stories and tell stories at a time when you couldn't actually tell these stories outright because they were heresy and they would get killed. Um, so those are all the things that I've, I've spent, you know, so much of my life in museums and digging through the art history and and that kind of thing. And then in my case, I got really, really lucky. Um, I ended up meeting the descendants of Matilda and have became very close to Matilda's, the, the family who, who call themselves uh, the Canosas to this day, uh, the, count, the current reigning Countess of Canosa. Uh, her son is one of my best friends now. And so I also had a lot of cooperation from the Canosa family. So that made a huge difference in getting this story. Wow. Out. Okay, so now transitioning to book three, which is about the Renaissance and about that art mm -hmm. will save the world and that it's all hidden in plain sight. I love this. And so what you're saying is that a lot of these famous artists were part of this order and continuing the line of Mary Magdalene and, and that, that teaching. Um, and so you say this as, you know, you have to write in fiction, but how much of this is, do you believe to be true? Like, it, it, you know, it's kind of like, it feels a little blurred, right? Um, so, you know, I, w I would love to talk a little bit about art and what you're saying there and the Renaissance in particular and these artists, but also this piece of, like you're putting together the mosaic, you're putting together the story, you're writing it as fiction. And um, it's like, how much of it is true? Does that, does that make, question make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so let's, let me backtrack a little yeah. bit because I started to tell you that I initially set out to write nonfiction, right? It wasn't initially my intention to write, to write fiction. Um, and then what happened was in the earlier part of the 2000s, when I first started coming out with um, the stories that I was telling, particularly around Mary Magdalene, uh, the publishing world, I discovered that uh, everyone was afraid of it. I discovered that in the nonfiction world, people were not willing to look at my story because I wasn't an academic, because I didn't have um, some kind of tenure, because I didn't have initials after my name. I had all this amazing information, all this research I had done on these women, particularly about Magdalene, and I wanted to take this out into, you know, into the publishing world, and I was excited about it. And uh, I was shut down so fast uh, that I was really stunned by it. And so many people told me, you can't tell this story, um, you know, this is... You can only tell the story in terms of revising religious history if you're an academic, uh, if you're a theologian, you know, if you're a scholar from Harvard, we might consider it. And I said, listen, the point of my stories is that I'm not an academic. The point of my stories is that I'm go I've gone beyond academia. I've spent all this time in the south of France, for example, 
gathering all this information about how it how it lives in the culture. Her her relics are there. People celebrate her every you know every day in the south of France. They have huge festivals to celebrate. They reenact her arrival on the shores of France. They reenact her sort of construction of Christianity. Like all these things are happen and they're real and they've been happening for two thousand years. And this is the stuff that academics aren't talking about. And ultimately, um, I was told you can't do this. You just can't. It's uh, no one would touch what I was creating. And so I was devastated by it, right? And it, you know, I had this real sort of dark night of the soul. Like, what do I do? I have all this information, and I'm, I'm so passionate about it, and I know it needs to get out. And um, and then I woke up in the middle of, one, of the night one night, and I went, I'm a storyteller, right? I'm Irish. We're all storytellers. All Irish people are storytellers. Um, I went, I'm a storyteller. You know what? I'm going to write this as a story. I'm going to write it as fiction. And then I don't have to prove myself, right? I'm going to, um, I'm just going to turn it into a beautiful story and, and see where it takes me. And so a couple things happened as a result of that. The first is that the irony of fiction is that it gives you so much more freedom to tell the truth, right? I was able to tell more of the story and be more honest with, with the story than I ever could have been if I was writing fiction, fiction, uh, nonfiction. Nonfiction is so careful and, you know, the footnotes and the, and the attributions and all of those things that I would have had to do in nonfiction. Um, whereas with fiction, I could just run with it. I could just tell this extraordinarily beautiful story the way it had come to live in my own head. And I realized that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to share the stories with people. And then what took me to the next level as I started to write was I realized, oh, this is about letting people experience these stories. I wanted to bring people into these stories in an emotional way. I want you to know these women with your hearts. I want you to experience their lives in a, it, viscerally, right? I want you to be in the emotion of what it meant to be these women of, of what it meant to have the kind of courage that someone like Matilda had, the kind of grace that someone like Magdalene had. You know, I, I wanted, that's what I could do with fiction that I could never do with nonfiction. And that became the gift of it, the ability to bring people into the story and, and put them in a place where they're really connecting to it and making it human. And ultimately, I mean, that was my destiny. That was what I was meant to be doing. Uh, and sometimes, you know, rejection is protection. Sometimes it, it just, we need to be sort of reconfigured and up on the right, the right path. And so I tell people that all the time, rejection is protection. If you're rejected in something that you know you're supposed to be doing, look at the different ways that you can, you can take it into a new direction. And that's what I did. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that is it. That is the gift is I got to feel like I was friends with these women, that I was in their lives, experiencing their lives. And it's so heartfelt and you just fall in love with these women and all the characters. You just know them as if you're right there in the story with them. And that's what I love and thank you for going in that direction because it did, it, it took a whole new, it took it to a whole new level. And so I think the two big questions are master, you know, like who's, who's master? Like, is there, what's the truth in this guy? Um, which is, yeah. <laughs> and then the books, like, are there really these books? I mean, yeah, those are the big questions. I think the reader is like left wondering. Those are the big questions, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those are the big questions, which uh, I'm still a little bit secretive about. Um, I'll tell you one thing. When people come to, you know, I do, um, I do groups to France every year, right, where I take people to these locations and, and I show them the Magdalene locations. And there is a particular place in France where I take people, um, when they do the, the Cather tours with me, um, I take them to a place called Arc, uh, which is where there is this, this medieval chateau. And in my first book, The Expected One, I talk about the Arc Gospel. Uh, and the Arc Gospel of Mary Magdalene is what The Expected One is, is based on. Um, so is there really an Arc Gospel? There is really, there are really documents. And I had a teacher from Arc who shared this version of the story with me 
and a number of other things. If you ever come to France with me, uh, you will see some of the artifacts that I was given uh, during the course of my uh, my research um, that are pretty astonishing, pretty amazing stuff. And um, the actual documents, the there I don't know where they are. Um, they are protected. You'll see in a lot of throughout the book. You'll see there's references to a number of secret societies, right? Uh, there is a Society of Mary Magdalene, which in the expected one I refer to as the Society of Blue, Blue Apples. Apple. Blue Apples is my name for it. That's not what it's actually called. Yeah. Um, but it's a society that has protected the Magdalene traditions in the Southwest France. It's just called the Society of Mary Magdalene in real life. Um, but that wasn't colorful enough for fiction, so I wanted to make it a little more interesting and pull in the Blue Apple story. Um, there is the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, which is really, really important. And the Order of the Holy Sepulchre is a through line through all of my books. And very important in my new book, the fourth book that's coming up. And the Order of the Holy Sepulchre is actually based on a legend that several of the male apostles um, on the day, on Easter, on the actual day of the, of the resurrection, um, embraced Mary Magdalene and said, we will protect you for the, and your, for the rest of your life and your children. Um, and we will take care of you. And that's why they're the order of the, order of the Holy Sepulchre, because uh, the Holy Sepulchre is, is the tomb, right? That's where, that's where Jesus appears to Magdalene. So it's in that moment that St. Luke and Nicodemus and a few other apostles say, we are going to take care of Magdalene. And these apostles end up in Italy. And this, this uh, order is established in Italy, and the order exists for the next 2,000 years. It exists today. Um, and there are a number of them, actually. There, of course, because it's been 2,000 years of people and, and ideas and perspectives. And so there's a lot of different factions and versions of it. But the Order of the Holy Sepulchre absolutely exists. Uh, and you'll find references to it if you Google it. Um, but this specific version um, I have followed from... Uh, from, from Italy all the way through. And um, they have relics, including uh, blood that belonged to Jesus, that um, are in, uh, enshrined in uh, basilicas in Italy, all kinds of things. So there's a whole documentation on this order, who they were, and how they evolved over the last 2,000 years. So they became really important uh, in the telling of the story. So all of that is to say there are a number of societies and orders and that type of thing that have protected this information over the years. And again, because for such a long time, it was punishable by death to be associated with some of these ideas, in particular if you were female. And even to this day, there is an enormous amount of secrecy around certain items. Like there are certain documents, like the documents that I, I was shown these documents in 1998. The documents that I was shown in 1998, um, those are those belong to an order that moves them around and, and uh, you know, only certain people at any given time know where they are. The artifacts that are in the Basilica in, in Mantua, there are 12 different keys that belong to 12 different people um, in order to access the place where the relics are held, for example. And so you have to be able to get all 12 of those people together and to agree in order to sort of open up this, you know, these these sort of vaults where a lot of these things are. So this stuff is real. It exists. It's up there. And I've been really blessed to be brought into them and to be shown some of these things and to be present when some of them them were open. And, and uh, you know, that's been the, the, the very fun and sometimes dangerous part of, of my job. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, so we will put the, the link for people to find out about this retreat. And I'm, I'm definitely interested. So we'll put that on the show notes um, and, and we'll all of these reference points okay. on the show notes. Yeah. So, okay. So let's get into book, the next book, which is a new character, an amazing new character. Yes. So share with us this new book that has just come out and why it's so important to you. So book four, it's actually book four in the series. Um, so it is actually, we went from the Magdalene line being a trilogy to the Magdalene line now being a series. Um, although I will say I wrote book four, <laughs> I wrote it to stand alone yeah. in that if you haven't read the other three books and you pick it up, you won't be lost. Yeah. If, you'll get a lot more out of it if you've read the other three books. Um, because it picks up with Maureen and Berenger and Tammy and Roland and all the characters from the modern times that you've kind of grown to, to know and love from the first three books. They all come back in book four and they discover this story about Anne Boleyn, uh, the second wife of Henry VIII, the first queen who is executed and um, is beheaded by her husband. Uh, and 
I want to say that I never, ever, ever thought that I would write a book about Anne Boleyn. I had, I did not set out to write a book about Anne Boleyn. It was never my intention. Uh, and not only have I written a book about Anne Boleyn, I've written three now. <laughs> so she really, really took over my life uh, in about 2009. And what happened was, you know, the stories, you know, there's so much written about Anne Boleyn, right? She's, there are a million websites a million websites right now that that are devoted to her or some aspect of Henry's wives that include her all over the world. There are shows. There's a, there's a new show on Netflix about her. There's three new books that came out about her this week. Um, you know, of course, The Tudors was a, was a huge hit. There's a, there's a PBS show on about her right now, about her whole family. But the, the thing that challenges me about all of these projects is that they – are always steeped in scandal, right? Mm -hmm. um, the most the most important books about Anne Boleyn, were, well, the the books that have been the most celebrated, that have won the most awards and sold the most copies about Anne Boleyn uh, over the last twenty years, both focus on her um, as essentially uh, a gold digger and uh, and and an opportunist and a, really just a terrible person. She's very dark mm. um, in these books. And and she's either a vixen or, a, or, or uh, a villain or a victim. Those are the three things that happen with Anne, right? And that's, those are the three things that happen with women in general. This is, this is, this is what happens in, with women historically. They're either viewed as vixen, villain, or victim, right? And, and, and all three of those things are, are, made to disempower a woman who is is strong um, in any way in personality in spirituality uh, in society and leadership because as soon as we make her a vixen so we make her a whore we make her sexually promiscuous we 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 disempower her that way uh, incest is one of the number one ways that's done so think about the women in history who were accused of incest Lucretia Borgia was accused of incest with her brother and Boleyn was accused of incest with her brother these are ways that you disempower women right um, and then you have you have villain well Anne was a, a home wrecker you know there's kind of this idea well yeah Anne Boleyn lost her head and it's terrible that her husband had her executed but didn't she kind of maybe have it coming mm -hmm. you know that's always sort of the that's the like, unspoken piece. She kind of had it coming because of her uppity behavior, right? We would never say this about a man, but a woman who who doesn't know her place, or a woman who is misbehaved, or is or is perceived as a bad girl, it might be okay to cut her head off, right? That, that might that might just make it acceptable. And the other issue with Anne is sometimes we she's portrayed as a victim, right? She was just kind of this helpless creature whose powerful father and uncle kind of moved her around like a pawn and threw her into the king's bed and she had and she had no options. Uh, all three of those things are completely untrue, entirely fabricated, and they are the tropes that have kept women down for 2,000 years, right? And so Anne has, Anne has always represented that for me. I've always, you know, when I first made my first list of the 15 women I wanted to defend, Anne Boleyn was on that list because I felt that she had always been um, intentionally maligned in this way. I always felt that Anne had a bad rap. However, um, I didn't think that uh, it was going to, there was enough of a story for me to tell that would, that would send me sort of on the same journey that I went with Matilda or Magdalene. But what happened with Anne is I found her in France. I found her in France. And when I found Anne in France, that's when I knew there was a story that had to be told, mm. right? Because all of the books about Anne Boleyn that are out there, all of them, bar none, start with her in England as an adult meeting Henry. None of them talk about her early life. And the fact is, Anne was raised in France. Not only was she raised in France, but she was raised in the courts of France. And she was mentored by the most powerful, interesting, amazing women who have ever lived in continental Europe, incredible characters. And she was mentored by all of them. And they are women who go on to change the world. They are women who create peace treaties. They are the women who are known as the mothers of the Reformation, the mothers of the Renaissance. And she was, she was raised in this incredible culture. And I discovered this because when I was doing all the Magdalene research, all the places where people go on Magdalene pilgrimages, I discovered that Anne Boleyn had been on a Magdalene pilgrimage 
when she was 14 years old with the Queens of France. And I went, that is a story. That is a story. And why is nobody talking about that? Why do we never hear that Anne Boleyn was raised in this heretical culture of, of believing that Mary Magdalene is the re true founder of Christianity? Um, and where does that take us? It take us, takes us to a completely different place. How can we ever look at her from this dirty lens that we have been given to see her through when we know that she was raised in this profound spiritual culture? She is a member of this Magdalene line tradition, and nobody knows that because no one had bothered to do the work. Because it's the, the research on Anne Boleyn and on the continent, her life in, in, in starting in Belgium and then in France is really challenging. Like it's not just, it's not anywhere to be found. You have to dig. And I did the digging. And I was very blessed along this path because uh, in 2009, I met the man who would become my husband. Uh, Philip Coppins, and he was a Belgian author and researcher, and he spoke both Flemish and French fluently, and those were the two languages that I needed for my research, right? Uh, because the material that we needed about Anne's childhood were in Flemish and French. So he became my, my intrepid partner uh, in, in research, and um, uh, he died young and suddenly he passed away. We were together for four years. He passed away in 2012. We're coming up on the 10-year anniversary of Philip's death. And, um, but during those four years, he was a profound champion of this story. Um, and, you know, he really, he really fell into it with me. And, and he was Anne's knight in shining armor. He was so determined to, to defend her that even on his deathbed, one of the last things he said to me was, do not rest until you tell Anne's story. So there's a lot of him in this book. There's a lot of his heart and his, his spirit and his work, his hard work, his translation work. Uh, went into into getting this information, um, you know, prepared and ready for me to to write this book, and um, and I I think this book is profound, and, and you know it's one of these books. The thing is, with all of my books, and I think you you've probably seen this. Um, you can either read them as entertainment, and in which case they're 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 fun and they're fascinating and they're page turners, and and they're great. But a lot of people read them many, many times, right? A lot of people, people have read my books more than I have um, because every time they read it, they get something new out of it because there's so much information and there's something that I call layered learning within the books, particularly books like the Book of Love. There's so much information in there that the more you read it, the more you get. And I really wrote these Boleyn books um, to be that way. They are, the Boleyn books can either be super entertaining and just a, you know, a really fun read or if you, if you read it with the eyes to see, it can be an entire mystery school. There is an entire mystery school in these books. And there's two books because the book was so big, it was 850 pages. So what we've done is we've cut it into two books. So the book that's releasing on December 7th um, is part one. And so it is the first piece of the book. Uh, it is part one. It is Anne's childhood in France and Belgium. And then part two, which will be coming out in the spring of 2023, is Anne's adulthood when she ends up going to England. Um, but I promise you, it was a very different version of Anne Boleyn than anyone has ever seen before. Uh, and I'm going to say that I'm going out on a limb with it because Tudor scholars are very, very um, precious with their version of the scandalous Anne. And um, even, even just in the early days when I would talk about my research online, people would say, oh, you know, you don't get to, you don't, you don't get to change who Anne Boleyn is. Mm. Um, but uh, I am going to change who Anne because it, she's been lied about for long enough. And why is that? Why, why is there such an obsession with taking this woman down? And all these women down. You've said it, but I just wanted to like nail this point here. But, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think one of the things that's been challenging for me as a woman is that a number of the obstacles that I've come up against have been, uh, have been other women, have been female authors. You know, um, the, the, two, the two authors who wrote about her in the most derogatory fashion are both female bestsellers. Um, there is a woman who runs the most successful, powerful Anne Boleyn site in the world who has gone on the record to say she thinks Anne Boleyn was a truly terrible person, you know, which I don't understand. I don't understand the psychology of that. I don't understand why you would create an entire life around a character that you think is a terrible person, but... 
Um, but all of these things are, you know, were a puzzle to me. They still are, you know, internalized misogyny is a thing. Um, but this idea that we need to keep her down into this place of scandal, um, that she doesn't get to be a spiritual revolutionary. She doesn't get to be a profound and complex and compassionate woman. Um, you know, there's, there's something that's just so enduring about these negative tropes. And I, I think part of it's the salacious angle. The same people that read tabloids like this idea, um, like the, like this idea of the, the of the scandal and the salaciousness. I think for some women, um, I, I think for some women, I found this with Magdalene too. They do like the idea that um, that a woman who can be uh, viewed as scandalous um, can also be redeemed in some way, right? Um, but, you know, overall, it's really, when I look at Anne and I look at Anne Boleyn's story and I look at how much she's been lied about over 500 years, she really is the poster girl for me, um, for how women have been kept down, um, by these, these tropes, these very patriarchal tropes, um, you know, in her case for 500 years, but in general for about 2000. Yeah. Yeah. It's a deep psychological wound for women, and I think it, it, it's this it's the sister wound that we talk so much about here at Sistership Circle of where we, some way of feeling better about ourselves to put other women down and to is essentially keep the patriarchy intact. And women are the ones who do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I got a little- It's, it's yeah, true. Yeah, I got a little emotional as you were talking about Philip, and so I just want to like really honor mm. him of like these Thank men you. who come in to really support the feminine. And yeah, it just yeah. reminds me of my own husband with all that his dedication to supporting the divine feminine rising in the world. And yeah, and what a what an incredible man to come in on the journey with you in that supportive role. I love it. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Amazing. And, and, and bless them. And there are a lot of them out there. Yeah. They, they deserve to be, they deserve to be celebrated. Yeah. Because, uh, and that's actually why kind of going backwards, that's why I wrote the poet Prince, you know, because my first two books are very profoundly about, you know, women, Magdalene and Matilda. And I wanted to write the poet Prince as the third book because I really wanted to celebrate these men. Right. Um, like Lorenzo de' Medici. I'm in love with Lorenzo de' Medici anyway. Just, um, and, you know, and, and because men are maligned and misunderstood too. You know, people, if you read, oh, the Medici were a crime family and they were, and they were tyrants. And, and, you know, the more I dug into the Medici, the more I kept finding how, you know, how beautiful and, and how much they revered women and, and, and how they, they, they get, you know, Cosimo de' Medici gives the first speech uh, in, in defense of um, homosexual relationships. Like they're the first, the Medici were the first progressives, right? They were really all about celebrating beauty and letting people live their lives and realizing the power of women. And of course they revered Magdalene too. Um, and so that's why I decided I wanted to write the poet Prince I wanted to celebrate men in history who have protected those, you know, those ideals of the divine feminine, which is what the entire Renaissance is about. You know, so many of those artists and specifically in my books, as you know, Michelangelo and Botticelli. Um, Botticelli is sort of the hero uh, of the divine feminine in the Renaissance. And um, so I wanted to celebrate the men in, in all of their, their support of us because they, they deserve it. They des deserve to be celebrated. Yeah. That's that hero scamos. That is the it's the it's the integration and the honoring of both the masculine and feminine, and how we are in partnership and coming together. And it's not that one's better than the other, and the celebration of both. So, thank you for that because that is such an important piece. And again, those like mul the multi layers. I can see all the multi layers, and you. And even like you talk about with art, it's this infusion, right? Like you're infusing and putting the spiritual teachings in. And so it's like these different layers and the embodiment of that and the way in which you're, yeah, even just like, well, here we are talking about like men and women, you know, well, 
duh, we're going to put, the, <laughs> we're going to do that in the three books where we're actually going to, um, you know, showcase that. So yeah, beautiful, beautiful work. Okay. okay so, um, all the links to all the books are going to be in the show notes as well as how to uh, join Kathleen on her next retreat. And we'll have some other resources in there. So Kathleen, to just wrap this up, um, and just thank you for being such a brave woman in the world and following the courageous path here. If I was to have you just shout from the mountaintops, what, it, what do you really want? our listeners to, to take away with them from, from this work that you've done in the world? Um, you know, the, the motto that's on all my books is the truth against the world, um, which is the, uh, which was the motto of the, the warrior queen Boudicca, right? The first century queen uh, who defeated the Romans in defense of her daughters in defense of the women of her tribe. Um, and I want to say that we need to be, we need to continue to be brave. We need to continue to be courageous enough to tell our truth. We need to stand in our truth and we, and, and, and that can be a very, very challenging thing to do. Um, but our truth is that as women, we bring a profound power, um, to the world that is really needed right now, right? Like we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And, and those giants are women like Mary Magdalene, um, you know, who showed us the profound power of feminine leadership. Go, it all goes back to what it means to have the power of the divine feminine really infused in our culture. And that is, again, it's collaboration, it's compassion, you know, it's, it, it's all of these things that it means to, to be in community um, as a global culture. And I really feel that that's where we are now. We need these stories because we need these models, these examples of women who fearlessly lived this because it's time for us to fearlessly live this. Something just hit me really hard. In the world of feminine leadership today, so many women are saying there are no models. And what just hit me so hard is that you have literally brought forth and made real the feminine leader models. And that is what is such a beautiful contribution that you brought through with these books is that we now actually have a model of very courageous feminine leaders, spiritual women who we can stand on their shoulders. We can actually feel that connection to as we as modern women, as we rise up into our power today. So thank you for this beautiful contribution that you've given all of us. Yeah. Thank you. And just to bring that yeah. back to my, my new yes. book, it's all the new book is very much about that. It's really about the feminine leadership. It's about all of these women that, that you know, it's, it's about Mary Magdalene. It's about Anne Boleyn, but all of these women who led the way, for peace in, in, in sure. Europe at a time when the men were making war. It's time for us to come back to that again. We are the leaders of peace and compassion and community. The time returns. The time returns, my dear. Thank you. Up next, I've been reflecting on my journey to becoming a masterful circle facilitator and leader of an international organization to train women in leading circles and it came down to the, these 13 distinctions that I'm going to cover in the next episode. The Brave Woman Podcast is brought to you by Sistership Circle. As more and more women rise up into their leadership and take ownership of their truth and their voice, they feel a strong pull towards being in circle with other women. There is more demand than supply right now, so we need more women to raise their hands and be the leaders of circles. When women come to Sistership Circle to learn how to lead circles, the number one question they have is, what's the structure and what rituals should I use to create a powerful and potent experience? So Tanya asked many of the talented facilitators that she knows to contribute a ritual that they love. 
This handbook is designed to empower and inspire more women to lead circles using these beautiful rituals. Many of these rituals can be done individually to invoke the divine feminine and connect deeper with oneself. Use these for your own special ceremonies with girlfriends or in your women's circles. Go to sistershipcircle.com slash podcast dash ritual. Click the link at the bottom of this episode's show notes.